game in the macro world. Now then, I made a great cover to add to my hair. Yes. Uh, my lords, my lady, may it please the court, I appear on behalf of the Nursing and Midwifery Council with Miss Swords Keeley, who is attending remotely. Uh, my instructing solicitors um, sit behind me, as do lawyers from the Nursing and Midwifery Council. Uh, Mr Jap and Mr Jackson appear for Mr Somerville, uh, and their instructing solicitor and Mr Somerville are also present in court today. The sole issue in this appeal is whether mutuality of obligation in the sense of an irreducible minimum of obligations. So an obligation on an individual to do some amount of work is a prerequisite for LIMBY worker status within the Working Time Regulations 1998. Uh, we say firstly, our primary submission, that the Supreme Court in Uber decided that it is, uh, and this court is of course therefore bound to find that it is. Uh, but secondly, we say that other judgments of this court and the wording of the statute itself also establish that an irreducible minimum of obligations is a prerequisite for worker status. I'm going to spend most of my time on my primary submission in relation to Uber, but, but I will, of course, take you through the other judgments of this court. This, the issue in this case arises in relation to two different types of contract. Firstly, what is known as an overarching contract, also known as a global contract or an umbrella contract. That is a contract that continues between separate engagements, such that the continuing obligations link a succession of separate engagements or individual assignments. But the issue in Mr Somerville's case also arises in relation to what are called individual assignment or specific assignment contracts. Uh, and that is a contract in relation to a, a specific assignment. So I'm going to come on to give you some examples of those uh, to assist the court. The Employment Tribunal in this case held that the claimant worked for the Nursing and Midwifery Council under both types of contracts. And that's why the issue that you need to decide arises in relation to both of those types of contracts. However, the Employment Tribunal held that neither the umbrella contract nor the individual assignment contract could be a contract of employment because no, there was no irreducible minimum of obligation under either type of contract. <coughs> but notwithstanding that finding, he went on to find um, that the claimant was nevertheless a limb B worker. Do you need to understand why that is for each contract? In the case of the contract that's the overarching contract, the subject matter of the obligations were not such as to involve the provision of work or services. In relation to the individual contract, there was uh, an undertaking to provide work or services but the person could withdraw or cancel that after having accepted the undertaking. So there are different reasons as to uh, why each failed. And in, in indeed, my Lord, I will come on to take you through his, the judge's reasons in, in some detail. Um, but, but I will say, and, I, and I'll show you why I say this, I will say that the findings of the Employment Tribunal in relation to individual assignment contract were, were wider um, that, that, than your summary, and I'll, I'll show you why I say that. Um, so, so, just to recap, so the Employment Tribunal held no irreducible <coughs> minimum of obligation, but nevertheless held that Mr. Somerville was a LIMBY worker status, uh, LIMBY worker under both contracts. We think that the, the paragraph of the judgment isn't clear, but it's seemingly under either contract. Uh, and we say that that was an error of law, and we say that Uber puts the matter beyond doubt. Uh, by way of summary of our position, we say that Mr Somerville, uh, a practising barrister who sits ad hoc on fitness to practice panels when he has time around his practice as a barrister, and his other sitting commitments 
on other regulatory panels, is exactly the kind of person that Parliament did not envisage acquiring worker rights, such as a day one right to holiday pay. Mr Somerville's position, in a nutshell, is that the Employment Tribunal didn't err in law and that an irreducible minimum of obligation is not a prerequisite for Limby worker status. Uh, my learned friend accepts, I think, that it's relevant, it can be relevant to deciding worker status, but not that it's determinative. Uh, permission to appeal was granted by uh, Mrs Justice Williams QC, as she, as she now is, who heard the appeal in the Employment Appeal Tribunal. The structure of my oral submissions uh, this morning um, will be as follows. So I'm going to start with the applicable test for Limby worker status. I'm then, as I alluded to, going to take you through the findings of the Employment Tribunal as to the facts in some detail. I'm then going to make my primary submission, which is that this court is bound by Uber to find that an irreducible minimum of obligation is a prerequisite for worker status. Then briefly address my secondary submission, which is that this court is nevertheless bound to find that an irreducible minimum of obligation is a prerequisite for worker status. And then fifth and finally, I'll deal with my conclusions and remedy. In terms of timing, I'm aiming to finish by the short adjournment or just after my learned friend tells me that he will be roughly an hour and a half on his feet, so we have ample time today. My lords, my lady, before I commence my submissions, I just wanted to check that you should have three bundles. Oh, two. We have one in uh, the same bundle. Indeed, oh, the supplementary yeah. bundle is at the back of the yes, just the back of the core bundle. Indeed. Yeah. And so the supplementary bundle, just to assist contains the written agreements that were at play. So Mr. Somerville worked under two written agreements, both for two fixed terms of four years. Uh, that was the maximum that Mr. Somerville's allowed to work um, under. Allowed to work? Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, <laughs> um, so the, the Employment Appeal Tribunal's judgment has now been reported. It's reported in the ICRs. Uh, that wasn't available when the appeal bundle was lodged, but we do have hard copies of the ICR report to hand up if that would assist the court. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, very please. well, I, if I can move that. I'll start then <clears throat> with the applicable legal test for Limby workers. Uh, this is at Regulation 2.1 of the Working Time Regulations, which is in the Authorities Bundle, Tab 3. Mr. Somerville's claim is for holiday pay during the period uh, when he says he was a worker, uh, and that's why we're looking at Regulation 2.1 of the Working Time Regulations. But as this court will probably be aware, uh, an identical definition of worker status applies under the Employment Rights Act 1996, and you also have a copy of that in the Authorities Bundle at Tab 2. I appreciate <coughs> this is a preliminary issue, and it would be helpful to have the 29th of January order setting out the preliminary issue at some stage and I understand that's all that we're dealing with we're not dealing with holiday pay but at some stage it would be helpful if either you or Mr Jupp could explain what the claim is it's for money for holidays for what period uh, and how is it calculated and does it matter whether it's the overarching contract in which case he's working four years or does it matter that it's the individual contracts of assignment in which case there have been stop, start, stop, start with gaps in between. So it would be quite helpful if, you could, if somebody could tell us what money, in respect of what periods of holiday, uh, he's claiming. 
It my lord, Mr. Jeff, rather than you. My lord, I can tell you now uh, what, what I know about that that issue, which is that it's still to be decided. Uh, at present, uh, a remedy hearing has been listed, I think, for five days in June. Um, I understand it's still to be decided, but I'd like to know what the claim is. <laughs> my lord, I want fifty pounds representing the following weeks would be helpful. Um, my lord, I, I can tell you this: I don't think we have a schedule of loss as yet, so I don't think we know the exact sums that are being claimed. But they'll will be told uh, if Mr. Jupp knows that. Um, but as I understand it, um, what the claimant is claiming for is holiday pay in relation to the entirety of the period when he says he was working. Eight years. Eight years. So it uh, is relevant to know whether he's employed for eight years or whether he's employed for different periods between them. So we've got to decide the overarching contract there at this point, as well as the individual point. Um, also, and if it's just course, for an individual contract, how does it work? Because you get four weeks leave. Well, you can't get four weeks leave if you're working for seven days a year, but then you get compensation if the contract terminates. So what do you get? Do you get a proportion? or? So, so my Lord, indeed. And the issue of, um, and I'll, I'll show you the definition in a moment, of working time mm. is yet to be decided. That will be one of the issues for the hearing. In I understand it's yet to be decided, but it's some idea of what the parameters of the debate are would be helpful. So that's it. So you get compensation if you are terminated for holiday pay, but it's not holiday pay for four weeks a year. <coughs> it's for the working it's time. It's going to be Right. We don't need to worry about you that. You don't need to worry about that. But, my Lord, of course, it's not just Mr Somerville's holiday pay that is potentially an issue in this appeal. No, I understand that, but it tells us whether or not we need to decide the overarching point. Indeed, my No Lord. point in not deciding it. Yes. If, in fact, it's going to be relevant to Yes, uh, I would very much encourage <laughs> my Lord to decide it. Thank you. So, my Lord, we were looking at Regulation 2.1 of the Working Time Regulations. Um, and if I could ask you to look at page 9 of the Authority Bundle, where we have the definition of worker. <coughs> um, just above the second hole punch on page nine of the authority bundle. We can see there the, the definition of worker, and we can see there are two different types of worker. What's called a limb A worker. A limb A worker is an employee, and I'll come back to the definition of a limb A worker in a moment. And a limb B worker, which is subparagraph B, it is what this court is concerned with today. And a limb B worker is an individual who's entered into works under any other contract, whether expressed or implied, and if it is expressed, whether oral or in writing, whereby the individual undertakes to do or perform personally any work or services for another party to the contract whose status is not by virtue of the contract, that of a client or customer of any profession or business undertaking carried on by the individual, and any reference to a worker's contract shall be construed accordingly. And um, a couple of points just on that definition. It's not enough to be a party to a contract to do work. You must have entered into or work under a worker contract. And the definitive explanation of what is required in order to be a limb B worker is now contained at paragraph 41 of the Uber judgment and that is at tab 20 of the authorities bundle. So if I could ask you to turn to tab 20, and it's page 276 of the authorities bundle. <coughs> and Paragraph 41, at level with the second hole punch of the Supreme Court's judgment in Uber, limb B of the statutory definition of a worker's contract <coughs> has three elements. One, a contract whereby an individual undertakes to perform work or services for the other party. Two, an undertaking to do the work or perform the services personally. And three, a requirement that the other party to the contract is not a client or customer of any professional business undertaking carried on by the individual. When you say that's the test, isn't it just restating the statutory provision? Uh, my, I mean, my it's, Lord. It's, 
as the cases say, you go back to the statute. It's a statutory provision, it's an interpretation of that provision. I completely agree, my lord. However, there has been so much confusion about what the statutory definition means. There has. That, I'm that aware of, uh, but yes, okay. So, so my lord, I say but that... The test is the statute. The test is the statute, yes. but this sets up very clearly that the statutory test contains three elements. Yes, but that's very well established. <laughs> and so, my lord, the first element of the test... Yes. Is or the first element as set out in paragraph 41 is what we are concerned with today. We're not concerned with the second element, which is personal service. Um, and I'll note in passing that it's very clear from paragraph 41 that the requirement for personal service is a separate part of the statutory definition. Well, implicit in the statutory test is firstly it has to be a contract a legally binding arrangement. Secondly, the subject matter of that contract must involve a, an undertaking to perform work or services and to do so personally. My lord, that, that would turn it into four elements. <laughs> yes, I don't think it yes. matters how we count no. them, but that's what it's getting at. There's got to be a legally binding arrangement, the subject matter of which meets certain requirements. I, indeed, my lord. So, strictly speaking, the first element can be broken down into two yeah. separate elements, a contract, and then what kind of contract is it? I completely agree, my lord, but for now I'm going to stick with the three elements yeah. that, that we have in Uber. Um, the second element, um, as I said, is the requirement for personal service. It's not relevant to this appeal. The third element is what's referred to as the client-customer exception. Uh, strictly speaking, it's an exception rather than a constituent element of, of the Limby worker definition. So, so the way that it works is the employment tribunal must consider whether the first uh, two elements, or three elements if you like, of the definition are satisfied. And then, if they are, the employment tribunal has to consider whether the client-customer exception takes the contract outside of the definition again. So you are a worker if you fall within the first two elements, unless the client-customer exception takes you back outside that definition. Um, so strictly speaking, it's not a constituent element, as it were, more, more of an exception. Uh, there is some suggestion in the case law, and I'm going to show you this, that the requirement for an irreducible minimum of obligation uh, comes in when one looks at the client-customer exception. Uh, and I think the Employment Appeal Tribunal in, in this case thought that it was a relevant factor in relation to client-customer exception. I say that the requirement for irreducible minimum of obligation arises under the first element, as per paragraph 41 of Uber. Um, but if I'm wrong on that, I still win this appeal, even if it's part of the client-customer exception. Why? So, You're not appealing the finding on uh, client-customer? Well, my lord, in fact I am, because the Employment Tribunal um, dealt with it under its subheading dealing with the client-customer exception. And we're appealing that particular finding of the Employment Tribunal. Um, the appeal is that it's a prerequisite for worker status. Um, and all I'm saying is that some courts and tribunals have dealt with it as part of the first element of the test. Some have dealt with it under the client-customer exception. If you establish that the overarching contract was not within this, but that the individual contracts were, say you win on it to that extent. There's nothing to suggest that you take out the individual contracts because they then fall within the client exception. You've not appealed we, any we've not appealed, no. to that. Um, so you can't say that there's been some error in relation to the first bit of the statutory test when dealing with the last bit of the statutory test, can you? My Lord, the, the sole issue in this appeal is about whether irreducible minimum obligation is a prerequisite for worker status. Yeah. Uh, my only point on this is that I don't, I don't care where that fits within the elements of the test, but I do say it's a prerequisite. Um, you're right, my lord, that we haven't appealed no. in relation to the other findings no. about the client-customer exception. Yeah. As you've um, already alluded to, my lord, there is, as the Supreme Court held, there is no substitute applying the words of the statute 
to the facts of the individual test. Uh, and indeed, the position had become confused by applying various common law tests to the words of the statutes. But in, the, in Uber, the Supreme Court made clear that the task for the employment tribunal is one of statutory interpretation. So when an employment tribunal is determining whether an individual falls within the definition of worker, that's an exercise of statutory interpretation. If I could just take you back to the definition of worker status, which is at page nine in the authorities bundle. Yes. Um, as I already mentioned, a Lim A worker is an employee. There is no statutory definition of a contract of employment. That is left for the common law test, and that's usually the well-known ready mixed concrete test, which is a multifactorial test. <coughs> So we have a common law test for employment status, but the test for worker status is a statutory creation. Yeah, but it depends on the existence of a certain type of contract. Uh, my, my lady, yes. Um, but, but I do say um, that, it, that it's significant that um, you have a multifactorial test under ready mixed concrete that takes into account a, a wide range of factors. Whereas when one comes to consider the question of worker status, we are looking at a much more precise test, as it were. Before I move on, it's worth mentioning that there are a number of extended definitions of worker status. Um, by way of example, the Employment Rights Act in 1996 extends the definition of worker status um, to those outside of the LIMB definition you're concerned with, for agency workers, home workers, freelancers, and so on. Um, but here, you are only concerned with the standard definition. That is the definition which Parliament has decided is applicable for the right to holiday pay. Finally, on... Uh, the definition of worker status, I wanted to draw your attention to the definition of employment under discrimination legislation. So at tab four, you have section 83 of the Equality Act 2010, uh, and section 83.2 defines employment. <clears throat> And that is often referred to as the extended definition of employment. Um, and that is because it is wider than the definition of employment um, for, for ordinary purposes, such as the unfair dismissal legislation. Um, and one sees in particular at section 83.2a that employment means employment under a contract of employment, a contract of apprenticeship, or a contract personally to do work. The issue doesn't arise in this case, uh, but you will have seen, or you may know, that in a number of cases, the, this court and the Supreme Court have proceeded on the basis that the extended definition of employment, so this definition, is to substantially the same effect as the definition of, of a Limby worker. There is an ongoing dispute amongst academics and lawyers as to whether that's correct. Uh, so for the purposes of this appeal, I will focus on the case law dealing with Lim B worker status. And I'm only going to refer you to one Court of Appeal case on the meaning of the discrimination legislation. So my Lord to my Lady, I, I'm now going to move on to part two of my submissions, which is the factual backgrounds 
to this issue. The Nursing and Midwifery Council was established under the Nursing and Midwifery Order 2001. As this court will be aware, it regulates qualified nurses, midwives and nursing associates in the UK. Its principal functions are to establish standards of education, training, conduct and performance for nurses, midwives and nursing associates. And its overriding objective is protection of the public, including by promoting and maintaining public confidence in the nursing profession. The Nursing and Midwifery Council is a registered charity and it's funded primarily by registration fees paid by nurses, midwives and nursing associates. The 2001 order required the Nursing and Midwifery Council to have a number of practice committees, including what is now known as the Fitness to Practice Committee, previously known as the Conduct and Competence Committee. <coughs> and that was established under the 2001 order. And Mr. Somerville was, until his appointment expired in 2020, a lay panel chair of the Fitness to Practice pan uh, Committee. Uh, I say lay, uh, that's not because he's not a lawyer, that's because he's not a registrant. So he's not a nurse, midwife or nursing associate. The way that the practice committees are constituted is governed by rules, uh, which need not concern us, but are dealt with in the Employment Tribunal's judgment. But the key point is that the panels are composed of three members, including at least one registrant. The Nursing and Midwifery Council, as this court will be aware, is under a statutory duty to investigate any allegations made against a registrant that their fitness to practice is impaired. And where such an allegation is made, it's first examined by internal case examiners at the Nursing and Midwifery Council. And when they consider there's a case to answer, it's referred to the Fitness to Practice Committee for a hearing. So Fitness to Practice Committee panels are independent of the Nursing and Midwifery Council. This was uh, in part disputed in evidence before the Employment Tribunal but you will have seen that the Employment Tribunal rejected that evidence and held that there was no evidence that the Nursing and Midwifery Council sought to interfere with the independence of members. So Mr Somerville's role is to sit as an independent member of those panels and make important decisions about whether the fitness to practice of nurses and others is impaired. As I've mentioned, the claimant sat for two fixed terms, each of four years. Well, he was appointed. He didn't sit for two fixed terms. He was appointed and was held at the post of chair. And he sat on a number of occasions, hundreds of days in the first couple of years and a few days at the end. So he was appointed for two terms. Indeed, my lord. Um, and on each occasion, he was sent a letter of appointment confirming that he was appointed as a panel member and chair and on each occasion he was sent a panel member services agreement. Um, and, and as I said, um, he was reappointed for a second fixed year term. Before I come on to look at the specific findings made by the Employment Tribunal, I wanted to emphasize something of great importance about this case. There have been a series of recent cases concerning both employment status and worker status, where the courts have been very critical of what they have described as business models under which operatives are intended to appear to clients of the business as working for the business, but at the same time that the business itself seeks to maintain that there is a legal relationship of client or customer and independent contractor. So essentially, that the courts have accused at these businesses of duplicity and have described those contracts as having an air of unreality. Uh, and that's where the case of auto pens, uh, which the court will be familiar with, has proved so vital because it has allowed the court to look at the actual arrangements in practice 
and, and essentially uh, insofar as the courts haven't described the real arrangements or to cleanse has, has allowed those court, courts to look at what was really going on behind the contract. But this is not one of those cases. There is nothing in the Employment Tribunal's findings of fact to that effect. On the contrary, the claimant submitted in the Employment Tribunal um, that the written terms did not reflect the reality of the working arrangements, and that was robustly rejected by the Employment Tribunal. He held that the written terms were consistent with the evidence as to how the arrangements worked in practice. And he expressly, this is at paragraph 208 of the judgment, rejected the claimant's contention that the negation of the mutuality of obligations did not reflect the true agreement or was <laughs> overridden by the party's conduct or the practical realities of the situation. This is not a case, unlike many of the other employment and worker status cases, where there's any suggestion that the Nursing and Midwifery Council had put in practice uh, duplicitous arrangements. And this is not a case where there has been any criticism of my client in terms of the working arrangements that they put in place. The important thing then is to look at what he found. Indeed, yeah. indeed, my Lord. Uh, which brings me right on to, to that finding. So my lords, if I, my lords, my lady, if I could take you then to the um, Employment Tribunal's judgment, which you have in the core bundle, which is the first section of the, um, the, the bundle that you have. And I wanted to take you to paragraph 190. Which is at page 160 of the core bundle. So 190, um, this is the Employment Tribunal's conclusion as to the existence of an overarching contract. The Employment Tribunal holds there is an overarching or an umbrella or a global contract and its terms can be found in the letter appointments, uh, the panel member service agreements and its schedules and appendices. And then in the next paragraph, 191, the Employment Tribunal holds that there is an individual assignment contract. And the subject matter of that is important because the claimant accepted and was contractually accepting an obligation to sit on the hearing and the uh, council were agreeing to pay him a fee. Indeed. Indeed, my lord. So each That's time... the subject matter of that contract. Indeed. Each time the NMC offered the individual and the claimant accepted, he agreed to sit on the hearing for which the Nursing Midwifery Council agreed to pay him a fee. And that's a different obligation in substance from all the obligations in the overarching contract. Indeed, my Lord. And I say, and I'm going to come on to explain this, that although the question of um, irreducible minimum of obligations under the global contract, the umbrella contract, is relevant to the question of whether there is mutuality under the individual contract is not determinative. Yeah. So those are the key findings as to the existence of a contract. Yeah. The key question then is what kind of contracts are these? want to start by taking you through the findings of the Employment Tribunal as to uh, the terms of both contracts. So paragraph 96 of the Employment Tribunal judgment, this is at page 139. The Employment Tribunal set out clause 11 of the 2016 agreement and it was common ground that the 2012 agreement contained a materially identical clause. Uh, and that is a clause that negates uh, irreducible minimum of obligations arising. If we don't use labels, and it's probably better not to, because that presupposes that they mean certain things and that they're relevant. What the contract provides when you read it as a whole, clause 11, is that there is no obligation 
to offer work on the part of the council, no obligation to um, accept it. Uh, and even where the member agrees to accept it, he can cancel. That's what those obligations are. Indeed, my lord. I say it even goes further. So the panel member is not obliged to provide the services even if requested, but also at the top of page 140 of the court bundle. That's what I just said. Even when he's agreed to do it, yes. he can still cancel it. I didn't leave it out. I actually included all three. Uh, but, my lord, I, I say it goes further because um, a panel member can be hearing a case under 11.2.4, so he can be... Um, he has to use, but he only has to use all reasonable endeavours yep. to attend the hearing of that case on each and every day. Yep. So he can essentially abandon the hearing of a case. Yep, he He's not obliged to turn up for day two or day three of the case. Um, well, he can't abandon it. Well, uh, but my lady. Well, if, he, you know, if he broke his leg or something, then, then um, he might, despite his being ill, and uh, not be able to attend. But I think it's slightly overrating the pudding. Perhaps, perhaps, my lady, but certainly he's not legally obliged to attend day two and day three. He only has to use all reasonable endeavours. Under this contract, yes. But um, there's still the individual contract, and he can withdraw. If before the hearing starts he withdraws, that's fine. If he's ill during it, obviously it has to stop. Well, but whether or not it would be reasonable endeavours if he simply said, I'm not coming, I've had enough. Well, my lord, I'll, I'll come on to show you the findings, but. It's not the case that when he undertakes a particular um, an individual assignment, that he's doing so under completely different terms and conditions. Obviously, this agreement he's, still determines how he un undertakes the individual assignment. It's relevant to working out what the content of the individual assignment is. That yeah. would be a better way of putting it, I think. Yeah. Because as a minimum, it appears that the overarching agreement sets the framework within which. Indeed, individual right. assignments take place. Yeah. And I would say more than a minimum, and I'll come on to show you. But it is a legal assignments. obligation to undertake, to use all reasonable endeavours to attend the hearing. The obligation is to attend the hearing, and there's a specific restriction saying, and you can't get out of it by saying, well, I couldn't get out of bed that day, I felt a bit iffy, that wouldn't be reasonable. So the obligation is to provide services to attend the hearing, and that's reinforced by this, that's what he's accepted. Um, then if I can show you at paragraph 97, we can see that the written agreement specifically provided that the claimant was an independent contractor. Yes, but that's not determinative. That's what they think it is. But whether they've got the right label is for the courts, not for them. So that doesn't get you anywhere. Well, we, my Lord, it's, it's It relevant. may be a factor, and it's been used in some cases, but it's not the answer. Yeah. Uh, and then paragraph 107, which is at page 142 of the core bundle. This is paragraph 16 of the Code of Conduct, which the Employment Tribunal had held formed part of the overarching agreement. Um, and paragraph 16 provides that panel members should ensure they are available to provide the services as set out in the terms and conditions, inform the panel support team at the earliest opportunity if they have to withdraw from a panel for which they have been booked, it is expected that this would be for exceptional reasons only, and inform the panel support team at the earliest opportunity if they become unable to provide their services for any period of time. So what's the relevance of that? I mean, they aren't actually obliged under the overarching contract to provide any services at all, because it's are available to provide their services, uh, unless you're saying that imposes some obligation. And then if they withdraw, they've got to tell the panel support team at the earliest opportunity. So where do, what do we get from that? Well, what you get from that, my lord, is that um, essentially, and, and I'll come on to this when, when I deal with the judge's findings in relation to block booking, yeah. um, but essentially you have a position whereby Mr. Somerville can say, OK, I'll sit for these three days in July, and then nearer the time, he can say, well, actually, I can't do this three days in July. Yeah. And there's essentially no repercussions from that. Exactly, yes. So he can cancel. If he accepts block booking slightly different, that was used to describe the dates, what dates you're available. Yes. The actual notification of individual assignments, hearing dates, having accepted the hearing date, he can withdraw from it. Yes, with, with no the, repercussions. With no, yes, but he's, he can withdraw. So 
he's accepted the hearing date, and the question that you've got to ask is why is that not uh, undertaking to perform work personally? Uh, and if the answer is because he can cancel it, the question then that you need to focus on is, is a right to cancel equivalent to saying there is no contract within the meaning of the uh, regulations. That's what you really need to Indeed, my lord. Off. And of course, I say that the findings of the employment tribunal went much, much broader than that. It's not just about the right to counsel. Uh, but, but I'll come back to okay. that. Okay. Um, so I've, I've shown you paragraph 107, which deals with the part of the code of conduct. <clears throat> um, and then the employment tribunal's findings, um, which I've just alluded to, on the withdrawal points are at page page 144 of the core bundle at paragraph 120. So this is the claimant could withdraw from a case even after he was booked without a requirement to provide an acceptable reason. The only requirement was that he notify the allocation team. Uh, the judge went on to give two key examples and then says there was no evidence that he was penalised for withdrawing yeah, in this way. We know that, yes. So if he accepted a date, he can withdraw from it before the date happens, yeah. And then par paragraph 122, the employment tribunal rejected the claimant's um, case that he was essentially obliged to do a certain amount, a certain minimum amount of work for the Nursing Midwifery Council and held that members are not required to offer a specific number of dates and not sanctioned if they did not do so. If I could take you now to the judge's conclusions on the irreducible minimum of obligation issue. The first paragraph I want to take you to is paragraph 196 to 7, which is at page 161 of the core bundle. At 196 to 197, the Employment Tribunal sets out uh, the claimant's evidence on, on this issue. And at paragraph 198, the Employment Tribunal rejects uh, those, uh, that evidence. Holds that the starting point must be the contractual terms. They unambiguously provide that the NMC was not obliged to ask the claimant to provide services, and the claimant was not obliged to provide them if asked to do so. Now, under the overarching contract, which is what this bit is dealing with, there was no obligation to offer, no obligation to accept. And then he says, crucially, I went on to consider whether those terms were consistent with the evidence as to how the arrangements worked in practice. That's the judge undertaking the auto cleanse exercise and testing whether the contracts really reflect what happens in practice. And so at 199, the judge deals with the, the evidence that he heard on that particular issue. Um, and then at paragraph 200, uh, the judge rejects the claimant's uh, submission that he was like an Addison Lee driver and says the claimant's position was quite different. He controlled how many dates he offered to the NMC. If the NMC then offered assignments within those dates, he was free to refuse them. Not only was there no contractual obligation on him to offer dates, there was no obligation on him to honour them once he had accepted. He was free to withdraw and the NMC was obliged to arrange a replacement. Uh, then at paragraph 201, uh, another crucial finding by the judge, the contract did not provide for any sanction if work was not accepted or was returned, nor is there evidence before me that the claimant had been subjected to sanctions when he did not offer dates or withdrew from work which he had previously accepted. Uh, and then he goes on to, to give some examples and notes the claimant's reasonably high rate of withdrawal. He then rejects uh, some of the claimant's submissions in relation to the relevance of the monitoring process by the Nursing and Midwifery Council. Uh, and the next key finding of fact in my submission is paragraphs 206 and 207. Um, at paragraph 206, uh, the claimant's submission was essentially that because there was a lot of work 
there was an obligation on the respondent to provide work, uh, and the Employment Tribunal rejected that at paragraph 206. Um, and then at paragraph 207, the judge held, I do not conclude that in practice, so this is what happened in practice separate from the contract agreement, the claimant considered himself obligated to offer dates. And then he says, on the contrary, it is plain from the correspondence I have quoted that he felt able to warn Mr Johnson that he might reduce his commitment to the NMC and offer his services elsewhere. So paragraph 208, I reject the claimant's contention that the express exclusion of obligations to offer and accept work did not reflect the true agreement or were overridden by the party's conduct or the practical realities of the situation. Nor was I persuaded on the evidence before me that mere expectations on either side had crystallised into legal obligations. In my view, the most that can be said is that the NMC encouraged members to offer sitting dates and did so more actively at some times than others. So, for that reason, the Employment Tribunal holds that it's not a contract of employment. That's paragraph 209. The judge then goes on to consider the individual assignments contract of employment at paragraph 210 onwards. And notes that once an agreement that the claimant would undertake a particular hearing had been concluded, if the claimant did the hearing, the NMC was obliged to pay him, uh, and that arrangement differed slightly before 2017 and after 2017. However, as I've already found, there was no equivalent obligation on the claimant. He was free to withdraw from the hearing, even after the agreement had been concluded. Just pausing there then. So this is saying two things. There is an agreement to attend the hearing, yes. full stop. That's a contract to provide services on one analysis. But he can withdraw from it. And the question is whether or not the ability to withdraw from a specific agreement means that it somehow falls outside Regulation 2.1. Is that a proper analysis? Uh, my Lord, I say that it's more than that. But that's one part of the reason why the judge rejects the, um, why the judge finds there's no irreducible minimum of obligation under the individual contract. But I say it's broader than that. Uh, and I was about to show you the last sentence of paragraph 210 where the judge refers back to, as I've already found, there was no equivalent obligation on the claimant. So the judge isn't completely disregarding all of the findings that he's made as to the overarching agreement and what happened in practice. The judge is essentially incorporating all of those findings into his finding the here, 210. Is, he's agreed there is a contract to attend the hearing. And then there's the freedom to withdraw from it, even after that agreement has been concluded. My That's Lord, what it says. The, and the question then is whether or not the ability to withdraw from the concluded agreement means it's not a contract within NIMBY. Is that the question? My Lord, no. I say the question is whether there's an irreducible minimum of obligation under mean, the individual then? assignment contract. Well, well, in this case, you can't simply ignore the overarching agreement when it comes to the individual assignment, yeah. because the terms of the overarching agreement govern the individual assignment. But that's why he's entered into it. One, the terms of the overarching agreement says he's not obliged to accept one, and then says when he does enter into an agreement, he's got to use reasonable endeavours to attend. So that's one situation, but this is a different situation, and that's why the labours don't help. Well, what has the chap agreed to do? Attend the hearing? Does he have to? No, he can withdraw. And the question is whether that state of affairs falls within the contract. And to attach a label is really to try and get the answer that you want. Well, see, my lord, I say you can't describe an individual assignment contract as a completely different situation. Because it might be right that the individual assignment contract is specifically referable to one particular case. That mm -hmm. may be a day-long hearing and maybe more than a yeah. more than a day. But you can't ignore the other written agreements. He wasn't obliged to be offered it. He couldn't insist on being offered it. Indeed. He wasn't obliged to accept it. We know that. Water under the bridge. Indeed. He has accepted it. He has accepted He's it. He's written or telephone and says, I will do the 1st of the 3rd of May 2018. He can withdraw. And the, are you saying that there is no contract, that there is no contract to provide services? Or are you saying there's no contract to provide services under LIMBY because of the right to withdraw? That's the important thing. 
Not saying it's limited to the right to withdraw, my lord. Not. Well, what else is there then? Well, my lord, what I'm saying uh, and what I've shown you is the last sentence of paragraph 210, uh, and of course I'm about to go on to find, show you all of the other relevant yeah. findings. I'm saying that, that it would be wholly artificial when you look at the individual assignment contract to ignore all of the judge's previous findings. I understand that, but what fits the difference then? Apart from the right to withdraw, what fits stop it being uh, a contract to provide services? Well, my lord, I've already shown you all of the relevant findings in relation to the overarching <coughs> contract. Yes, this is the individual one. He well, didn't have to offer it, we know, but that's happened. Well, he didn't have to accept, but he has. That's well, happened. Well, well, my lord, what I say yeah. is that the terms of the individual contract include the terms of the overarching contract. Because when he is undertaking a hearing, it is obviously governed by those same terms. Yes, I understand that. I really do understand that, I yes. promise you. <laughs> but my question is different. You've shown us bits that said he didn't have to be offered it, mm. and he didn't have to accept it. Yes. And the world has moved on. He was yes. offered. Yes. And he did accept. Yes. So those bits but of it were interesting, but are historic. But, but, he, but let's, he, let's move on a step further. He, he doesn't withdraw, mm. and he does the hearing, and he's paid for it. Mm. Well, what's the analysis then? Oops. Going to come on to show you, my lady. Like, it's not just a case of turning up for work. It's whether he's working under a contract under which he's obliged to provide some work. And that's where I say the claimant's case falls down. Because, because he is he, never, yeah. whether under the overarching contract or under the individual assignment contract, working under a contract under which he's obliged to provide some work. Even once he accepts the particular hearing, he's not working under a contract under which he's obliged to provide some work. But what's he being paid for? Oh. I, there is no, uh, as I understand it, it was a, an agreed fact that if he doesn't turn up, he doesn't get paid. No, but if he does turn up and he conducts the hearing, what's yes. he being paid for? He's being paid for conducting the hearing, but that doesn't mean that he conducted the hearing pursuant to a contract under which he was obliged to provide some but That's work. because you're adding in the words an obligation to provide and what you're really trying to do is say the ability to withdraw. The contract is to provide services. Has he provided services? Yes. He went, he sat, he decided. Did he withdraw? No. And what you're saying is, ah, but he could have. And therefore, he was never in a position where he legally had to. Well, my Lord, That's what you're really saying. It's not me being semantic. It's because the wording of the legislation requires there to be an obligation no, under the contract. And I'll come on to give you some examples. to be a contract whereby the, individual, whereby the individual undertakes to do. Not a contract whereby the individual undertakes and is obliged and can never not do it again. It's describing a state of affairs. Worker means an individual who has entered into or works under, or where the employment has ceased worked under, any other contract where he undertakes to do. It's you who are adding in the words, an obligation to undertake. My Lord, it, it's unfortunately not me, it's Lord Leggett, but I'll, I'll show you where he yeah. says that in a moment when we come but on that's to what you're that. really saying, I think. It's, I, I am you're adding the words obligation in, and the word obligation is not used in this context to deny the fact that he can't be insist on being offered it and doesn't have to accept it. Once he's undertaken a booking, a uh, hearing, the only thing that stops him undertaking it is the fact that he can cancel. My Lord, I, I'm going to continue to show yeah, you the, the findings yeah. of fact in relation to this, and then we can move on to what the Supreme Court said and yeah. how they approach this. Um, so, as I've shown you, um, mm -hmm. we've dealt with the overarching contract, we've now moved on to individual assignments, and I've just shown you paragraph 210, uh, and I'll emphasise again because I, I think we've we've been talking about other things, that there, at the end of paragraph 10, the judge refers back to his earlier findings. Uh, and that's one reason of many why I say you can't just ignore the rest of the contractual terms when you're looking at the individual assignment contract. The individual assignment contract is yes. overarching contract plus this. Yeah. Um, paragraph 211, second sentence, the only obligation on Mr. Somerville was to notify the NMC at the earliest opportunity, a provision which did not exclude a late withdrawal. 
Um, and then paragraph 212 is, I say, important. It says, I find support for that conclusion in the fact that in practice, no explanation was required for withdrawing from a hearing, uh, and provide some examples. Um, there was no obligation on him to find a replacement. That was the NMC's responsibility. His right to withdraw was not even contingent on the NMC's ability to find a replacement. Nothing in the contractual document documentation Again, pausing there, the judge considers the contractual documentation relevant to the individual assignment contract, or in the party's own conduct, was consistent with a decision by the claimant to withdraw from an assignment amounting to a breach of contract. So that's relevant to the legal obligation. Question, is there an agreement to perform work? No, there isn't. No agreement to perform work. Because of the right to withdraw. <laughs> <laughs> um, Paragraph 213, the employment judge holds that there's insufficient mutuality of obligation to give rise to an employment relationship by reference to the individual assignment contracts, uh, and then goes on to find at paragraph 214 that the position is analogous to an upper tribunal case, and we're going to come on to consider uh, her, her ladyship's judgment in that case in this court. Yes. Um, it's paragraph 242 of the judgment, which is the paragraph that is essentially this appeal is brought against. So the Employment Tribunal then moves on to consider worker status, the Limby worker status. Uh, and like I said, he considers the issue of, me of irreducible minimum of obligation again. He does so as part of the client customer exception, but as I said, that, that doesn't particularly matter. Um, and when the judge considers that issue, he notes that although he's concluded that there was insufficient mutuality of obligation to give rise to contract employment, he doesn't consider that the absence of an irreducible minimum of obligation is incompatible with worker status. So it's that particular paragraph of the judgment that this appeal is brought against, because we say it is incompatible. And um, as I mentioned at the start of the appeal, paragraph 242 doesn't specifically um, break the issue down in relation to global or individual assignment contracts, but we assume that paragraph 242 was intended to apply to both. Paragraph 242 also refers to bilateral obligations. So halfway down paragraph 242, the judge says, although I have concluded there were insufficient mutuality of obligation to give rise to contract employment, there were legal obligations on each side sufficient to create the necessary contractual relationship in the context of a worker status. That's a reference to mutuality of obligations in a different sense. So whether there are bilateral obligations such to form a contract. Um, it's a very minor part of this appeal, but you will have seen that ground two is against that particular binding, insofar as the judge is suggesting there that all one needs to be a worker is a contract. Uh, we say that that's obviously an error of law. Well, he's not saying that. He's saying he's, he's identifying the content of the contract. Well, uh, my lady... It, it, it's a very minor part of this appeal. That, that's ground two, insofar as the judge He's did not found it. Any old contract would do. The, the concern, my, my lady, is, is there were legal obligations on each side sufficient to create the necessary contractual relationship. There has to be a contract, not a yes. promise. Will you come to dinner? Yes, of course. And you don't. There's no contract. Will you do a hearing? Yes. I may cancel it. The question is. Is there a contract personally to do services? Is that negated by the right to withdraw? That's the real issue. And to use a global word phrase like irreducible minimum of obligation without actually asking, what is that talking about? Which obligation is it dealing with? Because when you get to the individual contract, as I said, 
the question really is, because you've already got over the offer and acceptance, the question is withdrawn, but you're going to come to well, that, you promise me. <laughs> well, well, my lord, the, the flip side of that mm. is the claimant, in order to establish worker status, has to show that he has fulfilled the criteria, the statutory criteria yes. as well. Has he undertaken to uh, do personal services? Answer, yes, he did. He well, them on the phone, he did the hearing. Well, well my lord, the, the, flip side, the flip side I say is he has to, he has to satisfy the employment tribunal that he was under an obligation to provide some work, and the employment tribunal doesn't find that he was under an obligation. Yes, it does. Two turns. Yes, it does. Two, four, three. Well, <laughs> my <laughs> you could withdraw from it on the individual contract. He wasn't obliged under the overarching contract. They find, but on the individual contract, he was obliged to hear, and he had to notify them if he was withdrawing, um, and, and that was the position. But he was, he had undertaken to do the work, but he well, could. Change his mind. I will come back to this point, but but I say there's no finding of fact here that the claimant does pr undertake to provide. Well, what does two one ten two ten mean? Once an agreement that the claimant would undertake a particular hearing had been concluded, so that presupposes that the claimant has undertaken to do a particular hearing and he'll get paid, and then further on. The bit that you like, however, as I've already found, there is no equivalent obligation on the claimant. That's in the context of cancellation. And then there's a colon, and he says he was free to withdraw. So that does appear to say that once he's accepted, he's going to do the hearing unless he withdraws. My lord, I don't accept that 210 is a finding that the claimant is obliged to provide some work. Is it? Yes, that's because you put in the word obliged, which you read into the regulations. Is that a contract to undertake services? My Lord, no. Because? Um, my Lord, because the Employment Tribunal makes it, far, uh, makes it clear, I say, that there's no legal obligation in relation to that. Because? Because, um, as, he, as he goes on to say, um, by reference to, to all, of the, all of the above findings, at no stage is the claimant ever under an obligation to actually attend that hearing. But once he's there, isn't he under an obligation to conduct the hearing? Well, my lady, no. But, but also, the crucial point is not whether he shows up to the premises. The crucial point is whether when he's working, he's working under a worker's contract. It, it sounds circular. But the, the, de the whole definition of Regulation 2.1 focuses on the contract and the essential elements of the contract. So one has to ask not just did he show up to the premises, but whether when he worked, he, he was doing so under that worker's contract. If you go back to page 9, <clears throat> work it means an individual who's entered into concept 1. Nothing has yet happened other than the entering into or work, i.e. he's doing something under it or where the employment has ceased, worked under. And worked under what? A contract to do, uh, where you undertake to do or perform personally any work or services. When it's finished, he worked under a contract. He didn't do it for nothing. It wasn't charity. He was paid. So what was it? It was, did he work under, has he completed the work under, a contract whereby he undertook to do it personally. And the answer is, surely yes, isn't it? My Lord, it's, it's not just a question of whether there's a contract, because of all sorts of people work under contracts. I'm currently working under a contract with my instructing solicitor, and that doesn't mean that I'm a worker. No, I understand that, but that's not relevant or helpful. <laughs> well, my Lord... But the, the, the client reception covers that in any event, so it's not yeah. really a helpful example. But... Well, my Lord, I say the, the crucial part is it has to be a contract whereby the individual undertakes to do or perform well, look any at the work past. or services. It means an individual who, who works under, or where the employment has ceased, worked under. So we're looking at entirely past events now where something has happened, something has gone on. And he worked under what? Any other contract? Is this a contract? Yes, we know that. There are bilateral obligations. Nobody's doubting that. What about the nature of the contract? It has to be where the individual undertakes to do or perform personally any work or services. Well, it was such a contract, wasn't it? Yeah. Because? He never undertook to do or perform personally any work or services. There's no finding in the Employment Tribunal's judgment that he undertook to do or perform personally any work or services. 
which my lady pointed out before, what is paragraph, first sentence of paragraph 243 refer to? That's a <coughs> reference, um, that's a reference back to the previous findings in relation to personal service. Well, isn't this the tribunal judge saying that he has decided that the claim attended into a contract pursuant to which he undertook personally to perform work or services? Uh, my Lord, no. I say that's specifically in relation to the personal service element, so the second element, which is separate to the issue that we're concerning here. So what are the words entered into a contract with the MNC? Um, there's no doubt that there's a contract. The question is whether it's a contract um, under which the individual undertook to do or perform personal work or services. That's 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 the point is, I thought you were saying that the UC hadn't made an ethical finding. Well, paragraph 242 and first sentence 243 read together. Um, I mean, you may criticise the findings, but those are the necessary findings, aren't they? Well, my lady, the language of the regulation. I say that if the judgment read as a whole, it's very clear that there is no finding that at any stage Mr. Somerville is under an obligation to, um, yeah. perform, uh, to, to perform... That's using any the word obligation, service. you see, in a particular way. What you are really doing, I think, as I've said before, is you're using the word obligation to cover a state of affairs where he can never be required to do it. And if you break it down, when he agreed to do it, did he agree to provide services? He agreed to provide services. And you'll say, ah, but he didn't undertake an obligation to do so. But he did agree to do it. If you'd asked him, what have you just agreed to do on the phone, Mr. Somerville? He would say, I've agreed to attend a hearing on the 1st of the 3rd of May. That's what he'd agreed. And if you went further and say, well, do you mean you have to go? Or can you send somebody else in the firm? Oh, no, no, I've got to go. And that's what 243 says. It's both concepts. He has said he would go to the hearing and he will go to the hearing. It's, that's what he says. Mm. Yes, there may be a set of circumstances in which he doesn't go when he exercises his right to withdraw. So, my Lord, just to be clear, I say 243 is about personal service, which is a separate issue. I but don't what? say it's dealing with the irreducible minimum of obligations points. And I say that you have to read the judgment as a whole. Um, you, you can't just pick, pick up on that, that first sentence. And when you read the judgment as a whole, particularly the paragraphs that I've taken you to, um, where, he, where the judge specifically notes there's no contractual obligations on the claimant whatsoever to perform work or services, that that shows... I think, my, my Lord, those are my... You yeah. have that my submission on the meaning of paragraph 243. Um, the other findings of the Employment Tribunal relevant to this appeal um, are... Uh, the following. Um, the claimant now practices uh, as a barrister in, in a number of areas of law. He sits and at the time sat on a number of different regulatory panels, including a panel convened by the General Medical Council, the MPTS. Uh, paragraph 128, the judge notes that the, the claimant were not working, uh, undertaking work on regulatory panels, was free to work for anyone, save he couldn't represent nurses and midwives. Uh, and the Employment Tribunal held at paragraph 225 that that was based in ethical considerations uh, and wasn't relevant to the question of status. Paragraphs 159 to 160, the claimant was responsible for his own income tax and national insurance contributions and he paid national insurance at the lower self-employed rates. Paragraph 161, on his tax return, the claimant described his business as a consultancy and professional disciplinary, and he offset various expenses against that business, including an element of his legal training. Uh, paragraph 228, the Employment Tribunal rejected the claimant's evidence that he had to wear a uniform and at paragraph 240, the Employment Tribunal rejected claimant's evidence that the Nursing Midwifery <laughs> Council controlled his decision-making. 
So those, I say, are the key factual findings uh, relevant to the decision that you need to make. Uh, moving then to the third part of my submissions, which is my primary submission, uh, which is that this court is bound by Uber to find that irreducible minimum of obligations is a prerequisite. Uh, I'm going to deal with this by way of a number of sub-issues. So firstly, there is a dispute between the parties as to what was the issue in the Uber case. The first issue I'm going to deal with is, is what uh, was at issue in Uber. Secondly, uh, again, there's a dispute between my learned friend and myself as to what Uber decided. And I say that it established four different propositions. Uh, thirdly, I'm going to deal with the question of what is mutuality in the irreducible minimum of obligation sense, so the nethermere sense that Lord uh, Leggett refers to. Uh, and then finally, I'll, I'll set out my conclusions in relation to my primary submission. If I could invite you then to turn back to the Uber judgment, which you have at tab 20 of your authorities bundle. <clears throat> I've shown you paragraph 41 of the Uber judgment which contains the, the legal test. But I also want to show you paragraph 42 of Lord Leggett's judgment, um, particularly the first sentence, which makes clear that the Uber case was concerned with the first of those requirements. And that is, of course, the requirement that this court is also concerned with. So, described there is below the letter H. The critical issue is whether, for the purposes of the statutory definition, the claimants are to be regarded as working under contracts with Uber London, whereby they undertook to perform services for Uber London, or whether, as Uber contends, they are to be regarded as performing services only for and under contracts made with passengers through the agency of Uber London. So essentially, the, the main dispute, as it were, between Uber and the drivers and the Supreme Court was who were the parties to the contract? Um, was it a contract, as the driver said, between them and Uber London? Or was it a contract, as Uber said, made with the passengers, between the drivers and the passengers, with Uber London just acting as an agent? And the parties to the contract dispute, as it were, um, dominates most of this judgment. So that paragraphs 43 through to 120 really focus on that issue, the issue of who were the parties to the contract. <clears throat> and as is well known, the Supreme Court finds against Uber on that point and finds that the contract is between the drivers and Uber London. And it then, having found that there is such a contract, so a contract that would come within the uh, Regulation 2.1 definition, that the court turns to our issue, as it were. And I say that that is very clear from 121 and 122. So 121, we see the heading working time. It says the secondary question, which arises in the light of this conclusion, is during what periods of time were the claims working? Uh, and it looks like the Supreme Court is turning its attention to, to what was the period of working time. But in fact, at paragraph 122, the court makes clear that but before those provisions are applied, it is necessary to identify the periods during which the individual concerned is a worker employed under a worker's contract so as to fall within the scope of the legislation. And at 123, Lord Leggett says, as mentioned earlier, the Employment Tribunal found that a driver was working under such a contract during any period when he A, had the Uber app switched on, B, was within the territory in which he was authorised to use the app, and C, was ready and willing to accept trips. And Uber contends it's not open to the Tribunal in law to make this finding, and that the Tribunal should have found that the claimants 
um, were only working under workers' contracts during periods when they were actually driving passengers to their destinations. Or there was an alternate uh, submission as well. So the Supreme Court, Lord Leggett then goes on to consider this particular issue. And the key paragraphs of his judgment are um, start with paragraph um, 126. Well, you have to do it to 124. If you were wrong on your main point, and if there was an undertaking to perform services personally, and the only reason why somebody like Mr. Sumfield could get out of it was the right to cancel, then 124 and earlier parts of his judgment appear to be saying that the right to cancel does not prevent it being a worker status. So it's only if you're right on the facts or your reading of the findings of fact that there is no obligation even to work when you've said you're going to work or even when you've turned up to work that well, you get to 126. Is that a fair summary? That your case really depends on finding that the tribunal did not find as a fact that there was any undertaking to perform services. Yeah. My case is there's no obligation there to undertake it. Yeah. The, yeah. You, you're, put differently, you're saying that the tribunal did not find that Mr. Somerville undertook to perform services. Yes. But, and so you say that the, para, the first sentence of paragraph 243 is what was wrong. Because that, that appears to be a finding that that's what he did. Um, so what, my, my lady, I, I hesitate to repeat myself, but just in relation to the first sentence of paragraph 243, I say that by that stage, the Employment Tribunal is dealing with the personal service question, and that actually reading the judgment as a whole, that uh, the Employment Tribunal never found uh, that there was... Right, so although that sentence appears to track the language of um, regulation 1, uh, sorry, 2-1 accurately, it doesn't mean what it appears to say. My lady, yes, it's... it's. Right. And when he turned up at the um, tribunal, it was happenstance. He happened to be walking past, happened to see there was a hearing, thought, oh, I'll pop it and do that one. Because he hadn't said in an agreement that he was going to undertake to do those services. Indeed, my lord, because I say you can't pretend that the written agreement and the overarching contract... He wasn't entitled to the... He wasn't there because of the overarching agreement. He was there because he'd said by email or phone, I'd be there on the first of third. My lord, I, I say you can't ignore all of the terms of the relevant uh, yeah. overarching agreement, which specifically say rest, he's yeah. never under an obligation. Yeah. But, well, it's the same point, but your case rests, unless you can persuade us that the tribunal did not find that he undertook to perform services personally, yes. then we one, two, four. If they didn't find that, and if they found that he was not undertaking to perform services, because that's the phrase, not obligation to perform services, he was not undertaking to perform services, then you say it's one, two, six. Well, my Lord, uh, the finding in relation to 124 is a finding of fact in relation to uh, the Uber drivers. It isn't, uh, I think, a proposition of law. I'm going to come on to deal with my lady's case. Which is the, well, it's the, um, last the football part. referees case, which I think um, is a more nuanced way of putting this particular point. And I'll address your point um, <coughs> then, then, if I may. Um, that particular finding is um, just in relation to um, how the how the app works. Um, well, it comes the, earlier in the judgment if you want to to worry about that, because the court also says that ninety one. This is 91, it says elsewhere in the judgment that if it's cancelling only, that doesn't stop it being a contract. So, uh, my lord... Yeah. Anyway, don't worry about it. But, that's, but, but you say, even if they found as a fact that he undertook to provide services... Well, well I say they didn't find that. No, no, I know, but even if they did... Yes. I understand the part when you say they didn't, but even if they did... But he has the right to cancel. Is that okay for contract of services or not? Well, my lord, I can't see how he's ever working under a workers' contract when he's when he's cancelled. No, no, no. Yes. When he's got the right to cancel. Right to cancel. 
And so, my lord, as, as I said, that if is they part find of that he undertook to perform services, it, but he had the right to cancel. That is part of the judge's reasoning for rejecting the claimant's case as to whether there's an irreducible minimum of obligation, but it's not the only part of the judge's reasoning. So, as I've said, in Uber, the Supreme Court deals with a central issue, which is the debate as to who were the parties to the contract. They then turn their question, uh, turn, turn their attention to the irreducible minimum of obligation points. Um, and they find, as my Lord has already alluded to, that the workers' contract came into existence when a driver logs onto the app. And then there's a dispute about what obligations uh, kick in when the driver logs onto the app. And the paragraph that I rely on particularly is paragraph 126. Uh, and that says that the fact, however, that an individual has the right to turn down work is not fatal to a finding that the individual is an employee or a worker, and by the same token, does not preclude a finding that the individual is employed under a worker's contract. What is necessary for such a finding is that there should be what's been described as an irreducible minimum of obligation. See Nethermere and Carmichael. In other words, the existence and exercise of a right to refuse work is not critical, provided that there is at least an obligation to do some amount of work. So I think in answer to my Lord's question, you asked me whether obligation was my word. It's not my word, as I've shown you, it's Lord Leggett's word. Um, the Supreme Court then go on to find that a paragraph 127, as a matter of fact, Uber had told the drivers that when they logged onto the app, that they were undertaking an obligation to accept work if it was offered. So once they'd logged onto the app, if they suddenly get a journey that comes in, they have to take it. Um, and then at paragraphs 128 and 129, Lord Leggett refers to the fact that drivers, Uber drivers, were penalised if they failed to comply with an obligation to accept a minimum amount of work. Um, so one particular way, I think, in which they are penalised is they're logged off the app, and they remain logged off the app for a period of time, essentially as a penalty, because they haven't been accepting all the journeys that have come in in the meantime. So in light of those particular factual matters, the fact that drivers had been told that they had to accept work when it came in on the app, and the fact that they were penalised for not doing that work when it arrived. Paragraph 130, Lord Leggett concludes, it follows that the Employment Tribunal was, in my view, entitled to conclude that by logging onto the Uber app in London, a claimant driver came within the definition of a worker by entering into a contract with Uber London, whereby he undertook to perform driving services for Uber London. I do, um, and then he goes on to um, deal with a separate, separate issue. And that's the Lord Leggett's conclusion on that. And then it's at paragraph 131 that in fact, Lord Leggett goes on to consider the periods during which a driver is employed under a workers' contract count as working time. I, I stress that because I think my learned friends suggest that the various paragraphs that I've been dealing with aren't about worker status at all. They're about when a driver is, is working or the periods of working time. But I say it's very clear from paragraph 131 that they're not. Um, in any event, um, we have a slightly un unusual situation in Uber where the drivers are entering into individual assignments Perhaps every time, you know, if they if they log onto the app several times a day, several times a day. Um, so in that context, perhaps when and when and whether become one and the same. Um, but I say it's very clear that the issue in those paragraphs of the Supreme Court's judgment that I've referred you to is about the irreducible minimum of obligation. So the question then is, what did Uber decide? And I say that it decided four key things. I say the first thing that it decided, Uber decided, is that an irreducible minimum of obligation is a prerequisite 
for individual assignment worker contracts, so not just umbrella global contracts. My learned friend, as I understand it, suggests um, that insofar as an irreducible minimum of obligations is relevant, it's only relevant to umbrella contracts. Um, but I say that must be wrong. As you've seen, what we're concerned with in Uber is individual assignment contracts. The contract that arises each and every time a driver logs, on to, logs into the app. Uh, not concerned with global umbe umbrella contracts. Uh, that's also made clear earlier in the judgment, paragraphs 41 and 42. Um, and as you've seen, paragraph 126, what Lord Leggett says there is looking at the individual assignment contracts, deciding whether they can be workers' contracts, one has to look for an irreducible minimum of obligation in the Nevermore sense. So I say it's very clear from those paragraphs of the judgments that irreducible minimum of obligation is a prerequisite for worker status under individual assignment contracts. My learned friend relies on a case called McMeachin. How does that fit with what he says in paragraph 124, that the cancellation of a trip uh, signifies only the obligation undertaken to pick up their passenger uh, is then terminated. It does not mean that no obligation was ever undertaken. So, <laughs> and what he's grappling with is when the contra workers' contract came into existence. Yes. But he's clearly saying in one, two, four, that the fact that you have a right to put it into to cancel doesn't mean that you. Uh, were not a worker. My Lord, I think what he's grappling there is the particular situation that arises for Uber drivers, whereby they turn on the app on their phone, um, and then lots of different jobs come in. Um, and of course, we've got the finding here that as soon as they turn on the app, they have to accept some, some work, but not every trip that comes in. And, and it's because there's an obligation to accept some trips, but not all of the trips, um, that the court is particularly concerned to make that finding at paragraph 124. And that is, in fact, um, an issue that arises in other cases. So the, the case concerns teachers that I'm going to come on to. Now, this particular teacher, she's a, she teaches at home. The council offers her lots of different pupils. She can take on some of those pupils, but she doesn't have to take on all of those pupils. But when she takes on a particular pupil, she is, and I'll show you this in a moment, she's under an obligation to keep on teaching that pupil as long as the pupil needs her until the pupil can return to school. Now, that doesn't mean because she turns down other pupils that there isn't an obligation to provide some work because she is obligated to keep on teaching that particular pupil. And I think that's the issue that paragraph 124 is dealing with. It isn't what Lord Leggett's doing in paragraph 126 is really just reformulating what uh, subparagraph B says in that you've got to have a contract whereby the individual undertakes to do or perform something. So what he's saying is if you have a situation where an individu individual doesn't undertake to do anything, it's quite difficult to see, see what that, how that would apply in practice, then you don't even get to uh, we don't come within the wording of the act. Well, my Lord, in my submission, he, d he does more than that, because what he does is he refers to two cases on employment status. Yes, but those are dealing with employment status. Yes. Was he developing the law, changing the law, or is he simply applying the law, which has previously established? My Lord, he's applying two cases on employment status both of which, as is well known, say there must be an irreducible minimum obligation to limb the definition of limby worker status. I say he's clarifying the law, but I do say that Uber means that it's beyond doubt that an irreducible minimum obligation in the nethermere sense is essential to come within the limby worker status definition. 
The problem that I've got is one, two, four, if you read the whole of it. I think it is clear that a driver enters into and is working under a contract with Uber London, whereby the driver undertakes to perform services for Uber London, if not before, then at the latest when he accepts the trip. If he afterwards cancels the trip, that signifies only that the obligation undertaken to pick up the passengers um, has terminated. And he really does seem to be using obligation, not as some sort of separate thing, in the sense of you must, under all circumstances, do the work. He's describing a state of affairs, you accept a booking, and that is a contract to perform services. And the fact that you can cancel it doesn't change the fact that it's a contract to perform services. And that seems to be awfully like what we've got here. He did agree, didn't he, to do the hearing. He accepted the trip. He accepted the hearing. And that seems to be a contract to perform services. Just bear with me. But he could cancel it. But you seem to be saying something even before that. That he's never accepted doing any work. I understand you say he's not legally obliged to. But that's a sleight of hand because the reason why he's not legally obliged to, once he's accepted it, is the right to cancel. My Lord, in my submission, if it was that simple, then we wouldn't have needed paragraphs 124 through to paragraphs 130, because um, what Lord Leggett says is, is really sets up the stall there, but then he goes on to consider why the drivers are obliged to provide some work, and he finds... That no, the... he's dealing with whether it's at an even earlier stage, even though they haven't actually accepted anything yet. You can't actually say, well, there's passenger A and he's agreed to drive passenger A to King's Cross. Even before that happens, as you get in some stages, like couriers, the contract is earlier, because the moment they turn up on their motorcycle as a courier, or the moment they log on to the app, it's at an earlier stage. Now, we're not at that, because we know the bookings. He doesn't have to accept the bookings and so on. But once he has accepted a booking, I'm still having difficulty in understanding how the person has not undertaken to Form services. Well, uh, my lord, in this particular context, we, we can't say that just because Uber drivers um, are said to be under an obligation um, in relation to a particular. Get tax. the word under obligation. Put that out of your mind. Obligation must might just be a shorthand for undertaking to perform services. So let's just use the words in the legislation. And the question is, did Mr. Somerville or did Mr. Somerville not undertake to perform services? My Lord, I, I say no, and I do say that it, it's no accident that Lord Leggett uses the word obligation. And the reason why he uses the word obligation is because that is what is required. And we, that's not what the Employment Tribunal found. There's no obligation for the claimant to do some amount of work, either under the individual assignment contract or under the umbrella contract. So... The obligation in this context of our case is, unless there's an obligation to accept at least a minimum number of hearings, it's not a workers' contract. Um, could some amount of work, I don't want to define some amount of work, but the Employment Tribunal considers all the evidence and doesn't find there's any such obligation. And um, We're dealing with the question of um, whether Uber establishes that an irreducible minimum of obligation is a requirement of individual assignment worker contracts. Uh, my learned friend relies on the case of McMeachin and says that irreducible minimum of obligation is only required for umbrella contracts rather than individual assignment contracts. And he says that McMeachin um, establishes that. So if I could ask you to turn to tab six so that I can quickly deal with that submission. Um, McMeachin was uh, a case involving a tripartite relationship. So you had a, an individual who was owed sums of money in relation to a job that he'd done. He was working through an agency, which went bust, which is why he was seeking to recover the sums 
uh, from the end user, uh, and the end user was the third party to the relationship. It was a case about employment status, um, but that doesn't uh, trouble us um, for the moment. The unusual fact, perhaps, of McMeachin was that you had a relationship between uh, the employee and the agency and written terms which specifically provided that once the employee started working on a particular assignment, common law duties of an employee kicked in. So there was a variance, as the court described it, between essentially the, the general or overarching agreement between the individual and the agency and the specific terms that kicked in on in relation to an individual assignment. And I say that McMeachin doesn't support my learner friend's argument, and it doesn't say that uh, an irreducible minimum of obligations is only required for umbe umbrella contracts. Um, in fact, it was a, a different issue that arose in this case. What was argued in this case, and one sees it very clearly from uh, 562F of the report, was that one couldn't sever a specific engagement from a general engagement. Uh, and that was argued by the Employers Council, uh, Lord Meston. And he essentially said that if you have a general engagement under which there is no irreducible minimum of obligation, then you can't look at an individual uh, assignment contract separately. And in the alternative, uh, Lord Meston argued that even if you could sever them and look at them separately, then the absence of an irreducible minimum of obligation under the umbrella contract was determinative of the position under the individual assignment contract. Uh, and the Court of Appeal rejected both of those arguments. Um, and, and I say that the key part of its reasons are at 563G through to Q. Sorry, G, um, and then over the page. At 564C through to E. So in summary, the court has to look at the two different contracts and consider the position in the context of first the general engagement and then separately the single assignment contract. Um, and then at 565 of the report on page 54, um, the court refers to the specific conditions that apply to the individual assignment contract. Um, and as I noted, they were rather odd in that they then obliged the agency worker to behave like an employee. Um, and noted in particular, and this is uh, under letter C, the conditions excluding mutuality of obligation are irrelevant in this context. That is not to say that in the different context of a general engagement, they would be without effect. They might there turn out to be of crucial, even decisive importance. In the circumstances of a specific engagement, however, there is nothing on which they can operate. When it comes to considering the terms of an individual self-contained engagement, the fact that the parties are not obliged in future to offer or to accept another engagement with the same or a different client 
must be neither here nor there. So I say that what Lord Justice Waite is deciding there is about the obligation to undertake future assignments, separate future assignments. That doesn't mean that uh, an irreducible minimum of obligations isn't required under an individual assignment contract, but it does mean that um, obligations in relation to future assignments or future work. In another way, your case appears to be, when you say obligation, because he could never be compelled to do anything, even when he does do something, it's not as a worker contract. That's it, isn't it, really? Well, so, my Lord, what, what I'm not saying is that because Mr Somerville wasn't any uh, under any obligation um, the following year to undertake a hearing, mm. that didn't mean that he couldn't be um, under an obligation in relation to the particular hearing in question. So it's unless about he can be assignments. compelled, I think when you talk about an obligation, yes. what you're saying is unless the tribunal found that he was compelled to take a hearing, yes. at least one hearing, yes. Yes. he can't be a worker. Yes. So he may agree yes. to perform as many as he likes and yes. never cancel them. But it wouldn't matter because it's the not the right to cancel, it's the absence of compulsion to accept in the first place. Yes. That's what you mean by reduced women. Yes, and, and I'm going to come on to show you a case where the President of the Employment Appeal Tribunal suggested that you could test whether there is an irreducible minimum of obligation by asking what legal recourse someone would have if they well didn't show up for a hearing. But why would Parliament require that if somebody did agree to do it? <laughs> why would Parliament say, well, that's not enough, you've got to be compelled to do it, otherwise he can't get any rights? My, my Lord, unfortunately, because this legislation was made in 1998, we don't have any assistance on what Parliament intended in the way that we do with later legislation. Well, just in, wasn't the working time regulation anyway implementing the directive? It, it, it was, my Lady, yes. So it's not that got anything to do with what Parliament well, um, save that the the definition in um, the definition of worker status in 1998 that's not cut and pasted from any European directive. It is our own national uh, definition of worker status. Uh, no suggestion that it's not compatible with the Working Time Directive. But, but why would a legislature say unless you can force him or her to do at least one hearing, he should be denied all the benefits? of the employment legislation. So, my Lord, What's the rationale? I can only guess what Parliament intended. But, my Lord, you'll remember that all the employment status cases on this topic, which go back, I think, to the 1700s, some of them relate to cases where you had master and servant, master and servant cases, where you literally had employees sent to jail because they hadn't turned up for work. That's what irreducible minimum of obligation meant in an employment context in those days. Well, but no, nobody in any of the old cases used the phrase irreducible minimum of obligation. Well, um, they perhaps, my lady, perhaps they use mutuality of obligation, but I, I use it to try and avoid confusion because, of course, we know that it's used in two senses in the case law. So we have the master and servant cases um, dating back, you know, as far as the common law goes, where, where you do have individuals being sent uh, subject to criminal sanctions for uh, contravening legal obligations they're said to owe their masters. So it's that concept from the employment status cases, from the common law, that one assumes then Parliament intends in 1998 to replicate in the 1998 Act, save... Those are about employees, and this isn't about employees, this is about people who are personally undertake, uh, undertaking to perform services well, my lady, that, that's, that's right, um, and one sees in the 1998 legislation that the requirements of a LIMBY worker status are different from an employee, so we don't have the control requirement that's found in the common law, for example. Um, <coughs> but, but that is my, guess, my best guess, my lord, as to why we see this, where it comes from. It's a common law concept. It, it comes from those very old cases about masters and servants. But it's not in the legislation. There's nothing there about compulsion in the wording of the legislation. You're reading it in, and you're saying it's based on what Lord Leggett said in Uber. Well, it, my Lord, I think this comes down to a disagreement between you and I about the meaning of the word undertake. Well, I think this is what it is, actually. Um, 
I, I think it really does come to that in, in a way because you say undertake doesn't mean I will do it means I must do yes, yes. So if I say to you I will carry your bag to King's Cross Station if you pay me £50 you say no 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 you're not a worker you must do it <laughs> uh, indeed my lord uh, and the reason why I say that's imp so important is because of all the reasons that I, I showed you when you look at this definition which is the emphasis is on the contract and on it being a worker's contract and an individual working under the contract uh, hence the emphasis on, on, on the contractual obligations under that contract um, and it's so not describing a physical state where the individual undertakes to do undertakes means any contract whereby the individual must do. It's not volunteers, it's not offer, it's undertake, my lord. Not even promises to do. And even when he's done it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> because even when he did it, he did it under contract, but not a contract where he was obliged to. So the contract's irrelevant. It's it sounds bizarre to me, is, is the problem. <laughs> well, I, I'm afraid, my lord, that, that probably many concepts in relation to employment status do, do, do sound bizarre. Um, but I, I do say that word undertake is important. Uh, and as I've, I've shown you, it's, it's the contractual undertaking in relation to um, and the provision of... That being the state of affairs where there is some separately uh, identifiable obligation to carry out the work. And that's what distinguishes, I say, a proper worker from, from someone uh, like the claimant, a barrister who can essentially pick and choose um, what work he wants to do, who, uh, as and when he wants to. Um, so, my lords, my lady, I've shown you McMeachin, and I've shown you that that doesn't mean um, that. Uh, irreducible minimum of obligation it is not required in relation to an individual assignment contract. Um, I want to show you uh, the decision of this, the judgment of this court in the Addison Lee case, which is the only judgment we have from this court since Uber on this particular issue. Uh, it is, of course, a permission decision only. It's the judgment of Lord Justice Bean refusing Addison Lee permission. But Lord Justice Bean recognised its general significance and granted permission for the judgment to be cited. Uh, and that's why I thought it important that this court look at it. It's at tab 21 of the authority bundle. Uber was about individual assignment contracts only, but the Addison Lee litigation was about both an overarching contract and individual assignment contracts. One sees that from paragraph four of the judgment, which is at page 302 of the authorities bundle. Um, and there Lord Justice Bean notes that the Employment Tribunal decided that the claimants were limby workers on two alternative bases. So an overarching contract, um, uh, and then goes on to deal with the individual contracts. So the alternative basis was that each time a driver logged on, he was undertaking to accept the driving jobs allocated to him and to perform driving services personally. The EAT upheld both conclusions. And at paragraph eight, Lord Justice Bean sets out the Employment Tribunal's findings in relation to the existence of an overarching contract. And if I could just invite you to read paragraphs 8 and paragraph 9, which contain the key findings of fact from the Employment Tribunal.
Yes. Um, my Lords, my Lady, I wanted to particularly emphasise um, some of the judgments uh, cited at paragraph 9. Um, so here the Employment Tribunal is dealing with the individual assignment contracts. Yes. Um, and at paragraph 49 of the Employment Tribunal judgments, they say it's halfway through that paragraph. We accept uh, then Mr Linden, now Mr Justice Linden's submission that the statutory definition of worker does not mean that the respondent is obliged to offer work. We agree with him that there must be a contractual obligation by the drivers to provide services. So, so once again, someone else, not me, using the word uh, obligation. Yes, but what does it mean? It means a uh, contract whereby he undertakes to do or perform. It's, this, it's, it's meaningless in an individual context. If you agree to drive or if you agree to do a hearing, that is what you've agreed to do. To talk about there being an obligation to agree to do some work actually ceases to be meaningless. He has agreed to do it. The only thing that will stop him doing it is that he can come out of it. Well, my lord, in this context, it, it's, it's different. So in this context, they log on, but once they log on to the app, mm -hmm. they have to actually do some work. They have to actually take but some... What this is concerned with is whether there's a contract. My lord, no. It's because whether it, it's the irreducible minimum of obligation. Well, it's, that may be your interpretation, but it says we agree with him. There must be a contractual obligation by the drivers to provide services. And if you look at the middle paragraph in paragraph, so paragraph forty-seven, there is, in our view, a strong implication of an underlying agreement. So, isn't it? Aren't they analysing whether or not there is a contract? For the provision of services, to cut it short. No, my lord. Um, what they're dealing with here is not the prior question of whether there's a contract, but the specific question of whether it's a workers' contract. I appreciate and that, but it, in order, they're saying it, it. You are. It is going round circles. In order for it to be an obligation, to use your word, there has to be a contract. Indeed. Yes. Otherwise, it's nothing. It's yes. a, as my lord said, it's a pure promise. Yes. So the important words is there must be a contract which, to use your word, obliges you to do something. Yes, so, so they accept the submission that the, work, the definition doesn't mean the respondent's obliged to offer work, yes. but they agree that there must be a contractual but obligation for as, the drivers to provide yes, services. As Lord Leggett may clear in 124, the fact that you subsequent to entering into that contractual obligation can uh, withdraw from, not offer those services, doesn't mean that it wasn't a contractual obligation in the first place. My Lord, I, I say this This is addressing um, a different point. So, my Lord, um, this is addressing the point of what obligation they're under once they've logged on. Um, and they say the test is an objective one. We need to ask what a reasonable observer in position of material facts would say the parties have agreed. Um, ignoring the period between logons, the drivers, when they were logged on, were undertaking to accept the driving jobs allocated to them. They were undertaking to perform the driving services personally. No other conclusions. Yes. So applying that to this case, when yes. Mr. Somerville agreed to uh, provide his services for a particular hearing, he was undertaking to provide services for that at that hearing. Well, my lord, I, I don't agree that he wasn't been... compelled to enter into that contract. He could have said no. Once he has entered into it, what stops it being enforceable? Answer the right to withdraw. You, you seem to be treating it because there's no obligation in the overarching contract to enter into it. Thereafter, when you have entered into it, you are saying, because there was no obligation to enter into it, there's no contractual obligation. That's mixing up two things, isn't it? Uh, I'm not saying the individual assignment contract isn't a contract, my lord. Right, so there's a legally enforceable obligation. What is No, the... I'm not. <laughs> so, my lord, I, I agree that because there's a finding of fact by the Employment Tribunal, the individual assignment contract is a contract. Yes. So what is it a contract to do? Um, my lord, it, it's a it's a contract 
in relation to um, it's a well. <laughs> I want to use the, fi I want to use the findings of fact by the employment tribunal. It, it is essentially a slightly artificial uh, construct, but just because there is a. But just to answer the question: What did the contract do? There is a contract. A contract to do what? Was it a contract to sell newspapers? No. If he did this, so it's once an agreement that the claimant would undertake a particular hearing had been concluded. There's agreement in relation to a particular hearing. Yes, so what is it an agreement in relation to? What does it require him to do about a that? A particular hearing. hearing. But there's no obligation under that agreement for him to provide a specific amount of work. But when you say it's an agreement in relation to a particular hearing, it's yes. too vague. Yeah. Is, is it not an agreement to conduct a particular hearing? We don't. We, all we have is paragraph 210, my lady. Well, what's your submission? Yeah. Well, I say that although it's a, an agreement in relation to the claim undertaking a particular hearing, it's not an agreement under which he is obligated to provide... Uh, well, so it's an agreement in relation to the claim undertaking a particular hearing. But it's not an obligation. There's no contractual obligation by him to provide work. Right. So what was he agreeing to do then? I'd like you to do this hearing on the 1st of May. Yes, I will do the hearing on the 1st of May. Well, Is that an agreement to do the hearing on the 1st of May? Well, well, no, or is it's it not... an obligation in relation to the agreement? To the well, hearing? I mean... Well, this is perhaps the artificiality of the approach whereby uh, the courts are construing each and every time a, a driver logs onto an app. No, but, never mind apps. Stick with this person. Stick with this case. Yes. You've told me there's a contract. Yes. You've gone so far to say it's an agreement in relation to um, the claimant undertaking a hearing. Yes. And I'd like to know, could you describe what the uh, claimant is to do under the contract. Well, well, this was, of course, for the claimant to call evidence in relation to, because it was for him to establish Limby worker status. What we do have is we have the Employment Tribunal who considered the arrangement at considerable length and in considerable detail. Yeah. And Employment Tribunal finding, and I think this is 212 that I, that I referred you to earlier, that nothing in the contractual documentation or in the own parties conduct was consistent with the decision by the claimant to withdraw from assignment amounting to a breach of conduct. So, so it's contract. So what we have there... Sorry, which paragraph? It's my, paragraph 212, my, 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 my lady. 212. Thank you very much. It's the last sentence of 212. Yeah. So it can't be a term of the contract that the claimant um, has to undertake that particular hearing. Yes, it can be. Because it's also got another bit that says you can withdraw. I will drive you, but if the traffic is bad, I won't. I will do the hearing, but for any reason that I like, I won't do it. Well, that is an agreement to do the hearing with the right to withdraw from the hearing. But you're saying, I sometimes you seem to be saying, there has to be a compulsion to enter into um, even one individual agreement. And I don't understand why it's necessary for there to be a compulsion to enter into one agreement, or why the fact that you have a right to withdraw means that the contract, which it is, wasn't a contract until you so, was withdrawn. My lord, if I if I have um, if you've understood me to say that there was ever a compulsion for the claimant to undertake some work, no, it's the uh, absence me of I... compulsion. Yes, <laughs> it's the absence of compulsion I've written down. Yes. That with the individual contract, he was never compelled to enter into it. He's, he's never obliged to do he's any work. Never obliged to. The problem is when he has entered into it. Yes. What has he agreed to do? Well, my lord, all we have is these findings of fact as the terms of an individual assignment contract. But I particularly rely on that last sentence, of paragraph two hundred twelve. And I say it can't be the individual assignment contract. It can't be a contract whereby he's obliged to do the hearing. No, by definition, because it's, he's entered into the one. There can't be a question of compulsion. It doesn't matter whether he's compelled to or not. He's entered into it now. And the question is, what has he agreed to do? He didn't have to agree anything, but he has. 
And what has he agreed to do? Well, my lord, he hasn't agreed that he will definitely do that hearing no, because, because paragraph two hundred and twelve. Withdraw. But if it's a withdrawal, that doesn't stop it being a workers' contract. There's got to be something else that stops it being a workers' contract. Well, well, my lord, I'll, I'll come back to that point because I, I don't agree with you on that. Okay, we'll leave that to one side. But assuming that, for, if, if that were right, the question is, what stops it being? Um, so. We're looking at the Addison Lee judgment. I've shown you paragraphs eight, I've shown you paragraphs nine. Um, this is, of course, only an employment tribunal judgment, but we have two very experienced Queen's counsel in this case, and Lord Justice Dean, who's citing those paragraphs, and no one is suggesting that those paragraphs misapplied the law. Um, the point that Addison Lee wanted to take, as I understand it, in the Court of Appeal, but which Lord Justice Dean refused permission on, was an auto cleanse point. So, in other words, uh, they they uh, wanted to take the point that the factual findings by the Employment Tribunal, as sat out here, were not ones open to the Employment Tribunal. Um, and of course, the Supreme Court and Uber made it clear um, that such auto cleanse um, points w w were permissible, uh, and indeed. Um, auto cleanse, the auto cleanse approach was the one that should be taken to limb the worker status. I just wonder whether 140 of the judgment, Mr. Darwin, isn't a good indication of what it was he was agreeing to do. When booked for a hearing, papers were sent to, to him and he had to read them and he was paid for that. So he agreed to read the papers uh, and then he, uh, the hearing was due to start at 9.30 and he could change it to 9 on subsequent days and he can stop at 3.30. Um, so those are sort of getting towards what the subject of the booking was, if that's what we're wondering about. Well, it sounds awfully like he agreed to do that which was necessary to conduct the hearing. And then when you go to the service agreement, that talks as well about things like he's got to do the reasons afterwards or work together with the others to do the reasons. And you begin to get a flavour about what it was that he agreed to do. He was never compelled ever to accept a booking, but once he's accepted it, we get a pretty good idea. Well, my Lord, you, you can only get a pretty good idea, though, if you ignore all the clear terms of the written agreement, which, of course... We're not um, talking about the written agreement here, we're talking about the individual agreement. Well, well you have to talk about both, my Lord. Yeah, okay. Because when you're looking at the individual assignment, he, he's not undertaking any individual assignment. Um, completely in isolation from the written terms. And so here you have Addison Lee. It, it's the only assistance we have on the application of Uber. Uh, we don't have any other um, court of appeal or employment appeal tribunal judgment that, if, if that applies the relevant part. Yes, if you look at paragraph 11 yeah. of Addison Lee, yes. that says expressly in the contract, there is no obligation on you as a driver to provide your services at any time or for a minimum number of hours. That contract expressly provided there was no minimum. Uh, so there's no obligation to do yes. anything. Yes. Um, but, but and then if you look at paragraph 13, Mr. Jeans notes the Supreme Court in Uber said that held that the right to refuse is not critical provided there is at least an obligation to do some work. I think that's your point. Yes. And then it goes on, uh, Lord Justice Bean goes on the last sentence. I do not think it is reasonably arguable that in that sentence Lord Leggett was saying that there was an obligation on Uber drivers to do a minimum of, uh, number of hours of work. Indeed, Mr. Jean's accepting the moral argument that Lord Leggett was referring only to times when each Uber driver was logged on. Yes. So what Lord Leggett was looking at was the consequences in terms of uh, the test set out in subparagraph B of logging on. The, the point, as I understand it, paragraph 13 goes to, my lord, is it, it wasn't the case that Uber drivers had to do 20 hours of work a year. They didn't have to log on. But once they log on, there was a finding that they had to do some work. That, as I understand it, is the, the point that's being addressed here. And of course, the difference between that case and the Addison Lee case and my case is that in Addison Lee, the clauses that Mr. Jeans is relying on are paragraph 11, 
are clauses that the Employment Tribunal found did not reflect the reality of the situation. So their clause is expressly negating an irreducible minimum of obligation. And as you've seen, the Employment Tribunal says, well, that no, in practice, there was uh, an irreducible minimum of obligation. But in our case, the Employment Tribunal looks at the contracts and say, the contracts reflect the reality of the situation. Mm. And that's why, whether you're looking at the overarching contract or the individual assignments contracts, you can't put the clear terms of those contracts, which apply to both, out of one's mind. Can I have one last go? I promise you to be a last go. I'm still asking myself yes. what he did on the phone. Yes. Um, will you sit? At the, will you do the hearing on the first? Yes. Episode? And you say I can't look at the individual agreement in absence of the overall agreement. I thought, good idea. I'll go and look at the agreement. Right. So I've turned to the supplementary bundle and I've turned yes. to clause eleven. Yes. And there's a good hint there. It says 11.24, where the NMC requests the panel to provide the services in respect of a case, and the panel member agrees to provide those services, yeah. the panel member will use all reasonable endeavours. I think, aha, this contemplates a situation where they ask him to do services, yeah. and he agrees to do them. So I quickly turn to the definition of services at page 28, and the services to be provided by the panel member the panel member will attend hearings and meetings and will carry out the functions of a panel member. And then they're listed. So it's beginning to look as if when he agrees uh, to a request, when he accepts a request, what he's agreeing to do is to provide those services as listed in Part A, isn't it? Well, uh, my Lord, I, I think uh, when we looked at this earlier, I, I told you what, what I say 11.24 means. Mm -hmm. um, at, at its height, I say, it's the panel members using his reasonable yes, Absolutely, that's what that obligation is, but yes. we're now doing it for a different exercise, you see. I'm not concerned with uh, clause one of the particulars of claim is in breach of this paragraph mm -hmm. of the agreement. I'm looking at a different exercise on a different sheet of paper. Yes. What was agreed on the telephone, expressly or impliedly? when he accepted the hearing on the 1st the 3rd of May 2020. So he'll use all reasonable endeavours to... No, no, that's different. That's what he agreed when he signed the 2016 oh. agreement. Yes. When he agreed on the telephone, we tried to work out what he did because nothing was written down. And what he must have done is there must have been a request as contemplated by this and he must have agreed to provide the services. And we know what the services are because they're defined. So the reality is he did agree to attend the hearing and he did agree to act as a panel member. My Lord, I say it can't be right that where you are having these individual assignment contact, uh, contracts, but in the context of this global contract, um, that if the, the obligation there is once he accepts to provide the services, he has to use all reasonable endeavours to attend the hearing, that a different obligation applies. Because one can only imagine that the, the reverse situation, whereby someone says, I'm really sorry, but I can't come to the hearing tomorrow because I, you know, Car accident, work. COVID, COVID, and yeah. the and the and the nursing would refer council turn around and say, well, actually, when we spoke on the phone, you said 100%. You have to be there. And he looks at the written terms and say, well, no. I mean, my written terms say that are only reasonable endeavours. I mean, that would create, I say, gross legal uncertainty. So clearly, I say 11.2.4 must be what he agrees to on the telephone. So you say that if one inserts into uh, uh, subparagraph B uh, individual undertakes to use his reasonable endeavours to do or perform personally work then it takes it outside B yes I say that's not that's not an obligation to do um, it's not an obligation yeah. so the use of the words all reasonable endeavours yeah. stops it being a contractual obligation to provide some minimum amount of work yes my lord well Sorry. So they then have to put in to subparagraph B, personally uh, undertakes uh, to do or p uh, perform personally a minimum amount of work. That's what the contract has to do. How do, how do I read subparagraph B with the incorporation by implication of the words minimum amount of work? And um, my lord. It's the undertakes to do or perform any work or services. Right. Any work. Any work or services. And it's Lord Leggett um, who uses the sum minimum 
That's and you wording. say that oh, right. if you put is simply the words all reasonable endeavours means that you're no longer undertaking to do or perform personally any work. Is that it? Yes. Have I understood correctly? Yes. Right. Not just that particular part, but but I'm saying there is no finding, uh, and that's why, of course, the employment judge reflect uh, rejects the case in relation to employment status. There's no finding that there's a an irreducible minimum of obligation. Funnily enough, I would have thought every contract has implicit in it that you will use all re reasonable endeavours, reasonable endeavours, to do your work. You're, you're not. Would you ever be expected to use unreasonable endeavours? Well, my lord, I mean, isn't it the just a necessary part of anybody's working life? Yes. Is that you're only expected to use your reasonable endeavours to get to work and to do the work, but not if you're ill, not if you're injured, not if the chief strike. There's a strike, exactly. Well, my lord, the, the difficulty here is that the task of Parliament was essentially that they needed to differentiate between groups of workers that they thought were deserving of day one rights such as holiday pay and so on, and self-employed contractors. Um, and, and of course, all of both categories work under contracts, uh, contracts in relation to... Uh, no, I understand that, but you're saying the inclusion in a contract yes. of the words all reasonable endeavours yes. means that all those contracts that include those words yes. are outside limbi. Yes. Yes. Another way of looking at it is You've agreed to be at the tribunal, and this is helping you. If for reasons beyond your control, i.e. you've made all reasonable endeavours and you can't get there, you won't be in breach. Indeed, my lord. Indeed. Well, that's against you, then. Because um, you have agreed to do it, but there's a get-out clause um, if you can't. But, but I say what would be required, and what would be required here was that you are in breach if you don't attend the hearing. But you will be in breach. Back to the fact that they're giving you this sketch. So at the moment, I've got three reasons why you say this is outside. I've got the absence of compulsion to agree to do anything. I've got the right to cancel, which you say, despite what my lady says in the Piedmont case, still means it's not an obligation. And your third reason is uh, got to be read in the context of the overarching agreement, and that only um, uh, effectively waters down the obligation to attend the tribunal using reasonable endeavours to attend. Those are the three reasons you say at the moment why on any of those three bases this was never um, a workers' contract. But, my Lord, I haven't finished with the Uber judgment, but I think because there, there's clearly some um, interest in, in what is meant by an irreducible minimum of obligations, that, that it might assist um, if I show you what um, the, the findings of particular cases in relation to this. So you've seen... Um, in the Uber case um, that a driver once logged into the app is required to be generally willing and available to take trips um, and you've seen that a repeated failure by a driver to accept trip requests is treated as a breach of that requirement uh, and you've seen what I showed you about the driver being kicked off the app for periods of time if he doesn't maintain a prescribed rate of acceptance um, and at paragraph 129 of the Uber judgment, when the driver is kicked off the app, um, it's last sentence, paragraph 129, um, it was reasonably perceived by drivers and was intended by Uber to be perceived as a penalty for failing to comply with an obligation to accept a minimum of what amount of work. So that's the, that those are the Uber drivers, and that's the minimum of obligation in relation to those drivers once they log in. <clears throat> um, and I've also shown you in relation to the Addison Lee drivers, um, that when the driver logs into the app, they're undertaking to accept the driving jobs they are allocated and to perform those services. I wanted to show you the findings in relation to the irreducible minimum of obligations in relation to the Pimlico Plumbers case. Um, you have the judgment of the Court of Appeal at tab 18. Um, as you all remember, no doubt, the case did go to the Supreme Court, but the it went to the Supreme Court on the issue of personal service. And the Supreme Court 
did refer to, and I think this is my learned friend's skeleton, the irreducible minimum of obligation, but declined to decide that particular point. So that is why you have the judgment of this court rather than the judgment of the Supreme Court at tab 18. Uh, and for now, I just want to show you the factual findings in relation to why Mr. Smith was under an irreducible minimum of obligations. Uh, and those key findings are paragraphs 109 through to 113. Uh, really starts with the second paragraph, 109. So the starting point is that, as Mr. Linden conceded in his oral submissions, the manual, including the provision for a normal working week of five days and a minimum of 40 hours, undoubtedly formed part of the 2005 agreement. And so the uh, Lord, um, Lord Justice Etherton there deals with the obligation to provide a minimum number of hours a week uh, and the conclusions at paragraph 113 um, after having deal with some submissions in relation to order, order cleanser halfway through paragraph um, 113. For the reasons I have given, it is perfectly possible to interpret the express words of paragraph 2.2 in a way that does so, namely that Mr. Smith normally had to be available to take on work for a minimum of 40 hours per week, but the company did not have to offer him work if there was none to offer him, and he was not obliged to take on any particular assignment on any particular day if he was unable or unwilling for any reason to do so. Uh, the fact that the company might choose not to insist on the full 40 hours work in any particular week is not inconsistent with those legal obligations which give practical effect to the combination of the express terms. So, so those are, that's the obligation on Mr. Smith there, a legal obligation to do uh, uh, yes. 40 hours work a week. Yes. So that was the contract in that case. Yes. Yes. Um, and then I want to show you finally the, the teacher's case that I referred to earlier, which is the case of Prater, Cornwall County Council and Prater, at tab 12 of the authorities bundle. So yes. th this case is about a home tutor who taught children who were unable to attend school for various reasons. She then uh, become, she then starts working for the local authority and the local authority agrees that she's an employee in relation to that period. So she goes to the employment tribunal to seek a declaration in relation to the period when she was a home tutor. So she wants a, a declaration in relation to her continuous service. Uh, and there's a statutory device in section 205 of the Employment Rights Act which, which allows her to uh, do that by ignoring temporary cessations of work. So the court has to look at these individual assignments for the jobs as a home tutor to see if they were contracts of employment because it's only if the individuals individual assignments are contracts of employment that the court can join them up as it were in order to find that there is continuous service and the findings of fact in relation to these individual assignments um, key findings as I say were at paragraph 11 so paragraph 11, although Mrs. Prater was not obliged to accept pupils offered by the council, once she had agreed to take on the work, she was obliged to fulfil her commitment to that particular pupil, and the council was obliged to continue to provide that particular work until the particular engagement ceased. So that's paragraph 11. And then paragraph 33 deals with the point. But isn't that very similar here? He's taken it on. He must attend the tribunal unless, having used all unreasonable endeavours, he can't get to it. Uh, well, my lord, no. I, I, because I hesitate. Why? I what, hesitate to myself. to read out cases where there are differences. The question is, what is the underlying legal principle that stops a contract to attend a tribunal hearing from being a contract of work? That's the problem that I've got. Well, and I don't know how this helps me on that at the moment. Well... My Lord, I, I'm trying to assist with the question of what is an irreducible minimum of obligations. Yeah. And in this case, because I sense the confusion. Was, yeah. um, uh, and if we look at paragraph 33 of the judgment, which is page 114 of the authority bundle, mm -hmm. 
Yes. And you can see that there was a, an argument there in relation to whether there had to be an irreducible minimum of obligation under both the general engagement, the overarching contract, and also the individual assignments. And so paragraph 33, in my judgment, the authorities do not support the council's argument for degree of mutuality of obligation over and above the mutual obligations existing within each separate contract namely the obligation on Mrs. Fraser to teach the people and the obligation of the party council to pay her for teaching the people to whom they continue to make available for teaching by her. Um, and then paragraph 40, subparagraph 5, is the final part of this judgment relevant to this point. Um, and this is um, a point that we've seen come up in, in the Uber judgments and others. It, nor does it make any difference to the legal position that after the end of each engagement, the council was under no obligation to offer her another teaching engagement or that she was under no obligation to accept one. The important point is that once a contract was entered into and while that contract continued, she was under an obligation to teach the people and the council was under an obligation to pay her for teaching the people made available to her by the council under that contract. And what's the difference here? Well, the difference being, uh, my lord, is that in this case, um, there's no contract entered into or that continues under which Mr. Somerville's under an obligation to do anything, whereas Mrs. Prater is under an obligation to teach the people as long as the people need teaching. He was under an obligation to attend the tribunal unless having his reasonable endeavour, he couldn't. It's simply unrealistic. He was obviously required by the contract to do something, and that was to do the hearing. And until that contract was ended, for example, he was due, it's simply unrealistic, isn't it? It's to say it's not a contract. Why not? Because I say it's not a contract. <laughs> well, my Lord, I, I can't say any more. You can't say any more, the, no, really. The, the, many findings, yes. the, the many findings by the employment judge that there was no irreducible minimum of obligations. Uh, throughout his judgment, he, he is very clear about that. Um, so that's why Mrs. Prater here the individual assignments contains an irreducible minimum of obligation. Because as long as that particular pupil needs teaching, we're not talking about one lesson, we're talking about, I think, perhaps a period of years in some cases, she has to keep teaching well, that particular pupil. Lesson? What if she'd agreed just to teach a, a pupil for one lesson? Well, Would she be a worker? Uh, my lady, she, she could be, yes, if, if she's obliged to. But in these particular facts, as I understand it, she's actually teaching pupils for, for much longer periods. She could be if she just agreed to teach people for one lesson. Indeed, my lady, because some of those Uber drivers may have logged on for 10, 15 minutes. I'm not suggesting that the time is in any way determinative. Right. We, we don't have the contract set out here um, because obligation is a shorthand legal term for the words on a piece of paper. And if the words on the piece of paper is, I will teach the children, assuming I can get to their house and there's no snow drift. Um, begins to look awfully like us. I do worry that you're trying to create a word or a concept as having a distinct autonomous meaning, obligation, when in the context of Regulation 2.1, it is actually a description of what you, what you said you would do. But you will say that's what undertaking is. It's an irrevocable commitment to do a minimum of work, is another way of putting it. My Lord, I say that's what Lord Leggett said in Uber. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I say that this case, Prater, is a much more typical example of the sorts of irreducible minimum of obligation that an employment tribunal was used to looking at. Um, the, the taxi drivers are perhaps extreme cases, but, but normally one has to look at particular assignments, and normally a particular assignment doesn't last for sort of 15 minutes, and those are the sorts of findings of fact. That, that you would um, typically deal with. Uh, one more um, point. One more point on, on this issue. So, what is an irreducible minimum of obligation before the short adjournment, if I may? Uh, and that is the case of Gunny, which you have at tab nineteen. It's a judgment of the current president of the Employment Appeal Tribunal. <clears throat> um, I don't need to go into the facts of this case, um, but at one point, the president of the Employment Appeal Tribunal suggests a test for an irreducible minimum of obligations. And I do say that that is a potentially helpful test. Where is that? 
It's a paragraph 55 of his judgment, which is at page 260 of the authorities bundle. And um, it starts halfway, halfway through the sentence, the letter A. The point can be tested in this way. Did the claimant have any legal recourse under the contract in the event the work stopped being provided? Um, in, in our particular context, a Limby worker context, um, because as I've shown you, the obligation is on the individual to provide some minimum amount of work. There isn't an obligation under the wording and legislation on an employer to provide some minimum amount of work. The reason for that is because some employers will uh, offer a retainer. They may offer money rather than work. Um, so for our context, I think it, it might be better, with, with no disrespect intended to present the Employment Appeal Tribunal, if it was the other way around. So did the respondent have any legal recourse under the individual assignment contract in the event that the claimant stopped undertaking work, um, even stopped midway through a hearing? Uh, and of course, in, in our case, you have the findings of the Employment Tribunal, paragraph 212. Uh, no, they didn't. But I just see this as getting a very long way from what this concept entails. And, and looking at what Lord Irvin said as, as long ago as when is it? 1998, 99 in Carmichael. He said that the absence of that irreducible minimum of mutual obligation necessary to create a contract of service. What this is talking about is what is necessary in order to create a contract. And th I'm not sure this expression, irreducible minimum of mutual obligation, has been used previously other than in respect of a contract of service. And what you're alighting on as it seems to me, are the last words in paragraph 126 of Lord Leggett's judgment to do some amount of work. You're saying that the in order for there to be a contract to undertake to do, you have to undertake to do some amount of work. Is that, what, is that your submission? My Lord, I'm saying there has to be A, a contract, and B, it has to be a contract under which you've uh, agree to undertake some minimum amount of work and so I say that is clear from paragraph 126 of Uber where Lord Leggett applies Nethermere and Carmichael both employment cases as you say my lord to a Limby worker case. And that's the first time that's happened? Uh, my lord no because I'm going to come on to show you other judgments of this court. Sorry so that you can have a contract absent an obligation to do some amount of work. But it wouldn't be a worker contract. You can have a contract to do some work, but it's still not a worker contract because you were never obliged to enter into it or you have the ability to get out of it. Uh, my Lord, it, it's not the first, it's not the first point because I'm not saying because you don't have to accept an assignment that that means uh, an individual assignment contract can never have the, the requisite mutuality. But I am saying it is the latter point, that unless there is How that... How would Mr Somerville then have satisfied, just take one hearing for three days, or one hearing for one day? How would he have brought himself within Limby? You say he can't. Well, well, no, my Lord, I say there would have to have been a contractual obligation that he undertakes a minimum amount of work. And they're just, on the findings of the Employment Tribunal, there wasn't. Your case is dependent on the tribunal saying that there was never any agreement to do any work. It finds it very clearly. So after lunch, you'll just remind me, because I forgot to put it in my note, but what he did agree to do then, and what the tribunal found he agreed to do. Yes, I will remind you, my lord. Um, so how much how those, much? Sorry. Yes, it's one, I think it's one o'clock. The clock's yes. not working, and I haven't got my watch, so I'm slightly um, It's 1.02. It, it's 102, my lord. Um, I, I still have, need to spend a little bit more time on Uber, but I'm almost at the conclusion of my primary submissions. My secondary submissions won't take me very long. So how long do you think, roughly in all? I, I would have thought 45 minutes after the short adjournment. Right. Thank you, then, uh, 2 o'clock.